timely to discuss Greek drama with Professor Stanford of Dublin. What would you say, uh, Stanford, is your primary interest in the Greek drama? It's antiquity or it's essential modernity? Well, in a queer kind of way, both, I'd say. If we went and saw a performance, I think, in the theatre of Dionysus in the time of Pericles, it would seem weird in many ways, completely outlandish. But yet, if we thought of the essentials behind it, I'm convinced that they are the essentials of modern drama. But, of course, it was first and foremost a religious rite, wasn't it? Ah, yes. That made it, in a sense. People didn't go there tired after the day's work. They went there at a great festival of the god Dionysus, early in the morning, fresh sunlight, everyone keen and interested to the, see the religious side of it. It began at the right end of the day. Exactly, yes. yes. And then they could get the full impact of this extraordinarily complex form of drama. You see, there was music, there was dancing, there were the elaborate rhythms, more elaborate than anything we know, and the whole impact must have been quite tremendous. We there? are, in some sense, returning to that, aren't we now? Yes, I, I would agree with you there. I think many of the most so-called most modern developments of drama are really getting back to the Greek essentials of the you drama. Mean Julius Caesar played in front of a packing that case. Kind of thing. Get rid of the scenery, get rid of the furniture, get rid of the footlights, get rid of the roof if you can, and concentrate on the people and the words. Do you think we should get back to masks like those of the classical actors? Not entirely, though I've seen a good many masked plays, and I think they're tremendously effective in their own way, much better than any close-up of these film stars, as far as I'm concerned, I must say. As I've seen masks used by actors in the East. It has certain advantages. You know at once who the villain and the, uh, who the hero is, but of course it has obvious disadvantages. Well, it cramps. Uh, one can't have mobility of features, but I do think it gets the idea of the person rather mm -hmm. than the ego of the actor. And what we're up against is the ego of these confounded actors most of the time. Yes. I really think so. In a sense, your classical drama was uh, a drama of disembodied ideas. Well, it's subtler than that. It's as if the character of Agamemnon of Oedipus took possession of the person and transformed them. It's not that it becomes abstract or symbolical entirely. It's a transformation, demon possession, if you like. Yes, yes. Well, now, uh, you see, we're well, tending more and more to approach the classical ideals and the classical techniques, in, even, in, in certain respects. I think so. I think one can go back to Greece, like to a pure fountain, and draw the original draught of water and then come into the modern age again and use it here with extraordinary success. One of those draughts of water can be drawn at Miletus. In terms of sheer power, this place Miletus produced more colonies than any other Greek state. Its theatre shows it at once to have been one of the great bearers of Greek tradition in Asia Minor. Here, 10,000 spectators watch the classical uh, and less classical dramas of Greece and Rome. Here at Miletus, Modern science was forestalled by the inspired oracles of Anaximander and Thales. Living creatures arose from the most moist element as it was evaporated by the sun. Man was like another animal, namely a fish in the beginning. So wrote Anaximander, astonishingly near the mark. And his teacher Thales even foretold an eclipse. Miletus eventually silted up and was left high and dry a fate it shared with its neighboring rival, Praene. Between them still flows the river Meander, which has enriched our language by its name as it meanders down to the receding sea. 